Hey, we begin a new sermon series today. It's going to last for four weeks. It's about people problems. And um, people problems are everywhere. Um, we have problems with people that we love. We have problems with people that we don't care for. We have problems with family members. We have problems with strangers. And uh, we just, it's, it's everywhere. It permeates us. And, and because people can be mean. People can be cruel. People can be dishonest. People can be deceiving. They can be critical. They can be hypocritical. Uh, and we can too. And you know, I would much rather deal with a machine than I would a person. I don't know if you would. Because a machine, you can hit it. <laughs> and not get thrown in jail. But a person, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Have you ever had a plan until you had to present it to people? And they just threw it out, or they had other ways of doing it. You know, life is great when everything works out the way we want it. But when you interject people into the situation, it presents a whole host of problems. And this will not solve every one of your people problems. I really honestly think that we will have people problems from now on. We just got to kind of get used to it. We have to learn how to navigate through this. And you would think that if we were spiritual enough, that we were godly enough, that, that if I was just a better person, I wouldn't have all of these people problems. And just to be honest, you might not have as many, but even the Apostle Paul, what I consider outside of Jesus Christ, maybe the greatest person who has ever lived, probably the, at least the greatest evangelist who has ever lived, he had people problems. We're going to look in 2 Corinthians, and this series is going to finish up a, a long, year-long series in, in 2 Corinthians at this, this church. Paul founded the church. This, th these people would not have known Jesus Christ as their own personal Lord and Savior had it not been for the Apostle Paul coming and sharing the gospel with them. They accepted Christ. They started the church. Everything was gone. He was their hero. He was their founder. And a group of people came in, not a big group, but a small group of people came in and began to teach some things that weren't accurate. They weren't right. And they began teaching them. As a matter of fact, they began to twist these Corinthians thinking away from the gospel and even away from the Apostle Paul where they began to resent the Apostle Paul. And so that's one of the reasons why he wrote 2 Corinthians is to kind of handle this whole problem of you're, you're not only leaving Paul, you're leaving the gospel. So the opening chapters talked about Paul defending his apostleship why he was who he was and what the gospel was and don't turn away from the gospel. And many of them had, most of the church had all of a sudden said, you know how you do? You know how you get caught up in something and you start doing the wrong thing and then you realize, oh, and then you turn back? Well, that's what the, the majority of the church in Corinth did. They woke up to the misdirection that they were on and they came back to where they should be. And Paul was encouraging them to get involved in a, in a financial gift to the poverty-stricken church in Jerusalem. But now in the closing chapters, he's going to deal with those who were the problem. He, he's going to handle some real big people problems and we're going to look each chapter kind of has its own theme or topic and today we're going to look at just what is probably one of the biggest ones is misunderstanding sometimes we just misunderstand somebody or they misunderstand us sometimes we don't explain it well they don't explain it well we thought they meant this they thought we meant that it was just a misunderstanding our personality sees it this way I'm a guy you're a girl you know how sometimes you misunderstand things and you don't communicate what you want and so there's friction and there's problems I think most most of our problems come from the idea of we just misunderstood what their intention was I won't go into detail, but I have had that so many times. I meant to say it like this. I wanted it to come out like this. This is what I wanted to say, but I didn't quite come across that way. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul did, is we're going to look in chapter 10. They actually thought that Paul meant one thing, and he didn't mean another thing. So let's kind of, let's kind of deal with it here. We're going to pick up some, what I would just call some attitudes, 
some attitudes that are good to have in any kind of people problem, but especially when there is a misunderstanding. And the first attitude that we should come into any kind of people problem that we're going to find out the Apostle Paul did, and that is humility. Whenever there's a conflict between me and somebody else, my first thought is I'm the one that's right. You know why? Because I am. (laughs) It's real simple for me. Why do I do what I want to do? Because I think it's the best thing to do. Everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. Actually, the Bible says that. I, I look at things, I make a choice, I do it. And whenever there's a misunderstanding, I think I'm right. But actually, Paul, now Paul is right in this, but, and even if you're right, you can approach the situation in humility. Just because you're right doesn't mean you have to bash your correctness on everybody else. And so Paul comes with humility to these people. So let's begin reading in verse verse 1, and we're going to kind of talk it through here as we go. We're not going to spend a lot of time in this chapter, but we're going to talk it through to see how we can deal with people problems. He says in verse 1, now, now I, Paul, he's personalizing this, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in, present, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. Let me just stop right there. We'll find out later on. One of their accusations against Paul was when he was with them, he was just a kind, thoughtful, quiet, meek person, a lowly person. In other words, he was kind of a, you know, he he didn't present himself well. But when he wrote letters, he was strong and forceful and powerful. In other words, away from them, he was this kind of a guy. But when you got down to meet him in person, he was nothing. And so they began to look at that and think, well, you know what? He's kind of two-faced. Why why is he doing that? And Paul's explaining why he behaved himself that way. Because he wanted to be meek and kind when he was with them. He wanted to to uh, live in humility in front of them. So in verse verse 2, he says, but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I'll explain that in a minute. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And we'll have to stop with that one. Paul says, you're blaming me, thinking that I walk according to the flesh, whatever my body wants to do, whatever my mind. He says, yeah, we, I, I have to live in this flesh, but I'm not going to do, I'm not going to let my body dictate how I'm going to react to somebody. And that's one of the marks of a mature Christian. We don't do what first comes to our thought. We hold it in. I want to say this, but you know what? My, but I'm not going to do that. I want to react this way. Have you ever done this? Have you ever cocked your arm back like you were going to throw a punch and then you had to release it? You wrote the email and you're ready to send, di- send and then you push delete. Have you ever done that? You know, your first reaction? Paul says, you want us to react in the flesh. You want us to kind of, you know, let you know. He says, no, no, no. We're having second thoughts on this. I need to be humble about this. I need to be a servant I need to be kind and compassionate. Yes, my letters were a little bit weighty, but I want, I want you to change. And he says, because when I come, there will be a time when I will come. Have you ever met somebody that you knew their bad side? And yet everybody else thought they were the kindest, meekest, quietest person around? And you just said, you don't want to be on their wrong side. You don't want to be around when they get angry. And that's kind of what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, if I have to, I will be bold. But I want to approach this kindly. To the false teachers, you are hurting this congregation. You are leading this congregation down a wrong path. I am not going to let you do it. And I've been kind. I've been courteous. I've been humble about this. And it's been on purpose. But one, if I have to, 
I will come boldly to you and explain it to you so you will, you will not misunderstand what I'm saying. And he says here, well, I think it's interesting, and we can kind of uh, encourage us with this one. He says in verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing, proud thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a, re in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Paul says, I need to capture my thoughts because you know your thoughts dictate what you do. And he says, we need to capture those imaginations, those ideas, those fantasies of what I would like to do, and we need to capture those. We need to be, we need to be in control of our thoughts and our emotions and not let our thoughts and emotions control us. And that's where I think a lot of us get in trouble. Some of, many of us are emotional people, and we react emotionally. And not just anger, but also sadness. And, and many of the other emotions that all of a sudden we feel this way, and so I'm going to act this way. Paul says, no, I am not going to let my imaginations control me. I am going to capture those thoughts. And you can do that. It, takes, it honestly takes, for me, it takes practice. I sometimes have to, when I'm, when I'm be, have you ever began to think down a, a thought trail that you knew was not going in the right direction? either because of anger or resentment or hurt or sadness, and you began going there, and you knew if I keep going down this, it's not going to lead me to a good path. Sometimes you have to, cap you have to like, just like you would if you see somebody going down a wrong path, you have to stop your thoughts and retrain it and start thinking of something else. And I'm not saying, oh, just think happy thoughts and you'll be fine, but if you're not careful, you, your thought pattern will take you down. And especially the proud thoughts, he talks about the high thoughts that I'm better than somebody else, that I know, that I know. Paul says, no, I, I came to you in humility, and I came to you like Jesus did. You see, think about this. Jesus, definitely the strongest man, not as much physically, but spiritually and emotionally, the strongest man who ever walked the earth, that if he, if he wanted to, he could have called 10,000 angels, but he chose to be quiet. He chose to be meek. He chose to be kind. He chose to be gentle. He could have called that, but he didn't. He, he says, I'm going to be a meek person. So when, when, when you're faced with people problems, a good position for you at least to begin in is, is a position of, of humility. That's not that you're a nobody. It's the fact, though, that you know what? I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to listen because I can learn more when I listen than when I talk. I'm going to listen, I'm going to be kind, I'm going to be courteous, I'm going to treat them like I would want them to treat me. And so approach those people problems in humility. The second um, attitude that is good for us to have is an attitude of submission. Or, yes, yes, I've had an attitude of submission. Um, Paul was the authority figure in the church. He was not just a pastor, although that is a position of authority. He was an apostle. He was called by God himself to lead the church. To hear from God inspired words that he might write them down, he actually wrote God's word. He had an authority. And he could have at any time used that authority to say, do this. But you know what he did? Rather than use his authority to promote himself, he used his authority to promote Jesus and encourage the church. He was not submissive to them, but in a greater way, he was submissive to Jesus. And we're going to find this out in a, in a little bit, too, in the last part. So let's begin in, in, verse, in verse 7. It says, Do you look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trusts to himself that he is Christ's, let him think, let, let of himself think this again, that as he is Christ, even so are we Christ. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Paul says, I have the authority, but you know what? I'm not going to use that authority to hurt you. Verse 10, 
For his letters, say they, Paul's letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also indeed when we are present. Paul goes on and says, Paul Paul has the authority, but he is not going to, to use the authority to hurt somebody else. I'm not using that to hurt you. He says, but if... If you don't turn around, if you don't get your act in gear, when I come, I, I am going to have to use my authority. Have you ever had a boss that used their authority to tell you exactly what to do, and yet there was no relationship, there was no kindness, there was no compassion? And that's what Paul is trying to do. He's, he's saying, you know what, I'm submissive to God. I am going to use my authority not to promote me, because that's actually what these false teachers were doing. From, from some of the references throughout 2 Corinthians, we find out that these false teachers had come in. They were promoting themselves. They were putting down the Apostle Paul. And they were taking some of the money that should have gone to help these poor Christians in Jerusalem and taking it for themselves. So they were promoting themselves. They, they looked good because they were, they were powerful. They were strong. They were authoritative. They knew where they were going and they were getting people to follow them. And Paul was just quiet. And it it seemed like when he was there was a pushover. So they said, see what he is? I mean, he writes big letters, but you know, don't don't listen to him. Listen to us. And that's one of the keys you can see when somebody is an authority figure that probably should not have the authorities when when they promote themselves, when they talk about themselves, when they're the hero of Every story, when they're, when they're it, Paul was submissive to the Lord. He didn't, look at, he didn't look to himself as the authority. And that's one thing that we can do. When we approach a people problem, we, need, we can submit that problem to the Lord. Say, Lord, here I am. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm not right. I think I am. Be honest with him. Say, Lord, but I, I give you this problem. I don't know how to solve it. I don't know how to help us to be on the same page. I don't know how to be, get beyond this conflict that we're in. And we've been in this for a while, maybe. But I submit to you. Help me to approach it the right way. Help me to have a conversation the right way. And to, to, to put ourselves in a, in a position not only of humility, but in submission. And the final one is a, an attitude and a position of surrender. Surrender. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. The people problems that we have in life don't find their um, strength, don't find their importance in us getting along. It's how is this going to affect the cause of Christ? So let's, let's, let's see what he says. It's kind of interesting because he's talking about, he's talking about two, really, these false teachers in the church, and he says in verse 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. They're looking at outward appearance, and they're trying to compare themselves with somebody else by outward measures. He says in verse 13, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measures, though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ, not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, But having hope when your faith is increased that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in any another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Stop right there. What Paul says here is Paul says, you know what? Um, We're trying to figure this out. We're trying to measure ourselves. Am I right? Are they right? Paul says, you know what? Here's the measure. The measure is are we doing what God wants us to do? And he says, I know what God wanted me to do. I know the measure that God God wanted me to go to Corinth and start the church. And that's what I did. 
And I not only want to go there, but I want to go even beyond the borders and go into other countries and spread the message of Jesus Christ. That's the big picture. The big picture is, is the gospel getting out to the people who have never heard. And evidently, Satan had come in, whether he was behind the people, we'll find out that Paul thought Satan directly was behind these false teachers, whether he was or not, or what was going on. We're finding out that the cause of Christ was stunted because of the people problems. Have you ever been, and I was, have you ever been in a church environment where things were going gung-ho, we were reaching the community, and all of a sudden some personal problems within the church, all of a sudden, it stalled. That's exactly what Satan wants. He doesn't care how or what or who or anything. He wants to make sure that people don't hear the message, that we are more focused on what's going on in here than we are what the needs of the people that are out there. So it's real easy for us to have people problems. But Paul says, what's important? Not to compare ourselves and my ministry is bigger than your ministry and I'm a better speaker than you are a better speaker and I have a bigger... He says, that's not the problem. The problem is, are we surrendered to fulfill what God wants us to do in reaching the world for Christ? That's, our, that's kind of our perspective right here at Faith Baptist Church. Is what are we, what are we, what are we doing to fulfill what God wants us. Are we surrendered? And he goes on. That's why I want to deal with this because in verse 17 and 18 is really the key to this part of it. He says, verse 17, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Let's glory in the Lord. Let's talk about what the Lord is doing. It's easy to talk about what I'm doing. I did this, I did this, I did this, because it makes us feel good. But Paul says, let's talk about what God is doing. You know, what, you know what's amazing? What's amazing is when God does something around us. You know? When God does something and we just look and say, you know what? I, I didn't have a thing to do with it. I just happened to be in the room. And God did that. I don't know how he did I was at a pastor's meeting this past week, and this guy, honestly, he's run a church of like 7,000 people. And he was perfectly honest. He says, you might applaud me and say, I'm doing a great job. He says, I have no idea what I'm doing. He says, I just happen to be in the leadership position and God is just blessing and I'm just trying to hang on and keep it together and, and finding out, you know, what's going on. Because what, to glory and what God is doing, not trying to compare ministry and ministry and people's lives and people's lives and I've got this problem, you don't have that problem and I'm better and you're better. What Paul says is, he says, let's glory in the Lord. He says, because it's not who commends themselves it's who God commends when it's all said and done it won't matter who patted you on the back patted me on the back said you did a good job you didn't do a good that won't matter the only thing won't matter is when you stand in front of Jesus and he looks at how you have lived the life that he has given you and you'll be able to turn around and say Jesus I did the best I could Jesus will know your heart he'll know your motives he'll know the difficulties that you had to struggle through and my prayer and your prayer is he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, let, me, let me give you some encouragement. If you're here right now and you say, boy, I'd like for him to say that to me, but I don't know if he would. You're in the same camp with Billy Graham. I heard one of the last interviews of Billy Graham, and they were talking about him standing in front of Jesus, and Billy Graham himself said, you know, I hope I hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, but I don't know if he will because I don't know if I have fully followed him like I should have. Billy Graham. <laughs> I mean, come on. I would rather you second guess if you're serving God like you should than for you to say, you know what? God's pretty lucky to have me on his team, you know? Um, you know, there's some um, football teams that have lost a player that, <laughs> that uh, thought he was, you know, the king of um, the, the team, and they're all trying to get rid of him in the NFL because it, it doesn't matter who we think we are. It's what does the coach think, and is he pleased with how we live our life? Um, Again, we're, I'm, I wish I could wave a magic wand over our crowd today and say, no more people problems, you know? Or just come down the front, kiss my ring, and you won't have any more people problems. 
I mean, I, you know, and that's basically what, the, what was going on in Corinth. Follow me and I'll, get, I'll take care of all your problems. You won't have any more problems. You know what? You might have the biggest people problem. I, I might have the biggest people problem tomorrow. This afternoon. But you know what? Let's, let's, let's deal with it in, in humility. Let's try to position ourselves in um, surrender. Let's try to find ourselves in a submissive attitude. And uh, let's let God work through our people problems because there, there are bigger issues even than our people problems. If you're here today and when I talked about standing in front of Jesus and you said, you know what, I don't even know if he would let me into heaven. I have good news for you. Actually, the word gospel means good news. Jesus has already paid your way into heaven. When Jesus died on a cross, and that's why Christians celebrate the cross of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the price for your sins. The Bible says God commends his love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. So that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can't get to heaven by being a good person. By turn over a new leaf. By quit doing the bad habits and start doing some good habits. So as much as it's good for you to come to church today, you can't get to heaven just by going to church. As a matter of fact, some people go to church thinking that's the key and it's not, it's not even part of it. It is to surrender, that last word we looked at, to surrender everything you are to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I know I've blown it in my life and I know I've messed up, but I don't have much, but what I have, it is all yours. And if you'll take it, I'd love for you to do something with me. Forgive me of my sin. The Bible, the Bible says that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, you confess with your mouth and pray to him and ask him to, to be your Lord and Savior, he will. Now, it sounds pretty easy, but it's not. It is simple, but it's not easy. If you're here and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, in your own heart right now, you can surrender your life to Jesus. Here I am, Jesus. If you'll take me, I'm yours. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads bowed, I want you to think about, I don't know what your people problem is. Maybe that intrigues you today as you begin to think about some, some friction, some fractures in some relationships that you have. I hope it'll help you just a little bit by allowing you to position yourself in a, a, a better place as you approach those people problems. But I'll be honest, your biggest problem is probably not with people. My biggest problem is with God. Because a lot of times I'm not as close to God as I know I should be. And the other problem person I have is me. I think too much of myself and too little of God. So our church service is designed so that you can have an encounter with God. And so right now, this is the time we ask you just to talk with God about what's going on in your life. The hurts, the pains, the hopes, the difficulties, the stresses. And if there's areas in your life that you know, you just know you need to let God take over, give it to him. He is a much better driver of your life than you are. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would love for you to surrender your life to him. In a few minutes, Barb's going to play through a song, and I'm going to be down here in the front. And if you just want to come and pray about whatever it is, God, isn't it amazing? God lays on our hearts something. And it may not even be anything I talked about today. It may be something completely different that God began to speak to your heart. Don't just let it sit there. Come and talk to me about it. You can sit on the front pew, or if you, a lot of people like to kneel. I'll give you that opportunity to be able to talk to God. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you care about all of our problems. You not only care about our eternal problems, you care about these temporary scuffs that we get into from time to time. You care about us. Father, help us to bring them to you. Help us not to become so proud that we're always right. 
And even if we are right, it helps to be humble and submissive and surrender to you. Father, I pray for those who don't know you as Savior. May today be the day that they receive Jesus as their Savior. Whatever the need is that we have right now, I know you can help us. It's just if we're willing to talk to you about it. So help people to talk to you. Your ears are open. Help us to share that with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.